We did like 7.5 million. First year I did it, launched it, scaled it. You but 7.5 million in the first year? Yeah. When you start getting payroll and team members and like the thing that you started to love doing, it becomes this like monster that you're kind of more managing than you are um, like enjoying your business. How long does it take for your competitors to funnel hack your stuff or buy one of those, your courses online for $35 that these fucking people sell to your Instagram followers and stuff like that? How long does it take for somebody to do that? And then now your your information is out there. There's 22 immutable laws of marketing. And what the first law is first is better than better. I've seen a kind of a scary trend. There's a lot of people who are like literally giving away entire courses online for free right they're putting like literally what they used to charge fifteen thousand dollars for on their youtube in a course or something like that totally for free you could all things being equal put out the same content and one requires a team of one person and the same amount of work and it's a one requires a team of 15 people i would always take the team of one the velocity of views is always fastest right when you publish it so we always publish at 12 o'clock monday wednesday friday our thumbnail designer creates two video or two thumbnails and after two hours if the click through rate is below six percent they will test the other thumbnail to see if it'll increase oh, interesting. Okay. yeah so that's the two buddies pretty cool that lets you to do that i don't want to be the last in this trend right now if the only thing separating you from your competitors is that you have better information than your competitors the real value what we provide is really in a lot of the client success team that we have, the one-on-one work that we'll do, the done for you, the mastermind events, et cetera, et cetera. The average cash per sales rep that we're able to that take in has more than doubled because now they're just speaking with threes and fours all the time. So we can see how our uh, score is going over time. So I can say people who come from YouTube, they're average a 3.5. People from Facebook ads, they're averaging a 2.5. Uh, this month, we're at a 3. This month, we're at a 2. And so over time, we have seen that YouTube by far gets us way more threes and fours. If I could eliminate it or automate it, I'll always try it. Even, at least test it at first. Mm. What's up, guys? And welcome to this episode of the Mindful Leaders Podcast. I'm your host, Dylan Vaness. And today, we have a guest named Ravi Avibala on the show. He's the founder of Scaling with Systems. He's an absolute systems expert. You'll hear as we go through this episode, we talk about how to create systems, how to create automation. He literally optimizes every part of his life from the what he eats to how he works out. So it's an amazing episode. You're going to uh, learn a lot about how to create systems in your business and your life. So uh, get ready. Let's go ahead and dive in. Everything says is A. I, oh, they, no, well, I said Ravi with a U because everybody, uh, it is Ravi with an A, but I say with Ravi because that's how it sounds. Oh, okay. Like okay. I blew Ryan's mind when I did it. It's like, I, so it's it's Lovey Ravi is what I tell people because it's the easiest thing to remember. It's like Ravi, like R-U-V-E, but it's R-A-V-I, you're right. And so people call you Ravi? Ravi, yeah, yeah. Or Ravi or yeah, which I, you know, whatever, I don't give a shit. But that's, <laughs> I just, that's, I, now I just started to introduce, especially in podcasts, I'll just, because I know what it's like because then we'll talk about 50 things and then you'll be about to introduce me and you're like what what the fuck was how do i say his name again? <laughs> so that's why because i've been on your end before so that's why i just introduced it as r-u-v-e got it okay cool so uh guys uh we've had probably a half hour of amazing conversation <laughs> before this <laughs> uh he gave us the secret to well told us all about his watch collection so uh dude uh I uh, like to start kind of with either like a controversial question or something that's uh, that's that can be triggering to some people. Uh, Love it. Yeah. So, <laughs> so, dude, have you ever been burned by an employee? And if so, what happened? Uh, have I ever been burned by an employee? I, you know, so one of my values in my company and in my personal life is extreme ownership. So I would never. Jocko's book is amazing, by the way. Yeah, that's I, so I read it and that's like I was like I was living some of it, but I don't think it was extreme ownership. And then I uh, I was like, oh, this is and then I, I have a 43 principles I live my life by. And I added that to that. And then when I uh, like I started learning about values in a company, I was like, OK, I need to have the values of the company be my values because that's the only way that like it'll be real to who I am. So I made it one of them extreme ownership. So for me personally, I could never say that an employee burned me because it was my fault for hiring them. But that's just the thing. Like for my first, I'll give you a great example. One of my first uh, employees was a client that ended up uh, eventually being client success manager and then helping out with some tech stuff. And then like I, as we started scaling, we hit our first like multiple seven figure year and everyone was like, oh yeah, yeah, you need a COO. You need a COO. Like people at your level have COOs. And so uh, I still remember because he, uh, this, this story is kind of funny. I'm at our events in San Diego, California, and I'm like uh, talking to a bunch of my clients. We had about 50 clients there. And I'm like, yeah, you guys need to get yourselves a COO. Like, you know, we got a COO recently. It's really good. And this guy I'm talking about, my employee, is like, wow, oh, we got a COO. That's that's cool. That's cool. And then I was like, yeah, it's this guy here. And it was, he didn't even know that he was a COO because I was like, <laughs> I was going to tell him. And the, and the reason I say that is because like, I just didn't know what I didn't know about hiring and employees and compensation and skills and all of that stuff. And so um, he, I don't think he did anything wrong by any means. He definitely helped us out a lot. But looking back, it's like, okay, if I actually wanted to pay somebody that amount of money and have them be a COO, like they should really have 
operating experience, not just be somebody who was like a client that was a client assist manager that like, I used to think COO just was your right hand man. But in reality, no, they have like a true job description with responsibilities, like one-on-ones with team members, et cetera, et cetera. So it wasn't that I was burned. Anytime I've had an issue with a team member, it's always been because I didn't know what I wanted out of that person first. Or the second thing was, um, I knew what I wanted out of that person. And that person had consistently shown me they couldn't give it to me. And I still kept them on because maybe they were a culture fit. And so I, li- I was friends with them, but they weren't a skill fit. And to me, those are always the hardest people to fire because it's like your boys with this person, but you know that they're not going to go anywhere. So I, even in the past, like six months, I've done like two or three fires just like that. And it's always so hard because like some of the, those are some of your original employees, but um, most of the time the burned people that have burned me were just because I was naive. Hmm. Dude, that's, I love that philosophy, by the way. That's awesome. Um, in, in my world, one of my first fires ever was someone I'd been friends with and <laughs> literally fired him and he starts crying like oh my god I'm like, oh man i've never had that <laughs> yeah, i've like never a grown, had that a grown man who's yeah that's that's tough crying. i don't know how i would handle that honestly just cry and pretend you care uh i mean you know whatever i'm not gonna judge somebody for crying or whatever but it's like what well, I, I honestly anytime i fired i've i don't i've never burnt a bridge i've never burnt a bridge like it, we might have left with like a little bit of tension but i've always made it a point to never like burn a bridge especially in our industry where it's a pretty small industry you know what i mean like i get people from other companies all the time that come work for our company and like they will sell me things about those other companies now a lot of times that they tell me in the interview process about how bad this other company was that's almost an immediate red flag that i won't hire that person yeah so i I, but if they come on the inside and then i'm like you know how did this person used to do it and they're like oh no this was a shit show or something like that that's when i'll usually figure out like the truth of the business Hmm. yeah Dude, I, I think I heard Jeremy Miner say something like that, too. It's like one of the things he looked for in interviewing process, like if someone's talking shit, like don't hire them. Or maybe, dude, maybe I saw that in your stuff. Like, yeah. it's such a genius thing. It's like I always thought, well, if they're talking shit, that company sucks. Yeah. But no, it means they're going to go to the next employer and they're going to talk shit about Exactly. You. If they were going to do it about this person. And, and I get that you could be a disgruntled person, but it kind of also goes back to my value of extreme ownership. So it's like if I I – Honest to God, I just hate people bitching and moaning and complaining. So, like, if I am on an interview and somebody's complaining to me, uh, I immediately am just like, "This, uh, I'm not going to be able to work with you. And uh, even for us, the way that we do our hiring process is uh, the first interview is always a culture and values fit, and the second interview is always a skill fit. Um, and, the, and before they even get on the first interview, there's, like, a skill test question to make sure we're not wasting time. So it's, like, skill test question, uh, culture, values, fit, interview, and then, uh, like, a true skill interview and so on the cultured one i'm usually asking like give me an example of something that went wrong at your last job and whose fault was it so i'll literally set them up to be able to like lean it on somebody else and i'll just be able to tell uh you know, it's sometimes they'll watch my content so they know my extreme ownership value but uh i'll be able to tell right then and there and even recently not recently but about a year ago i hired a house manager and uh, she wouldn't mind me saying this because I, I said this to her face but when she first started working with me she would like complain to me about like her mom or her dad or whatever else it is and I eventually just had to sit her down and I was like, look, like, um, I, I really love working with you, but I, I just, I don't like complaining. And so like, uh, whatever's going on in your life, you put yourself there. And I, cause I don't like complaining and I want to take extreme ownership. If you want to keep on working here, then I can't have you complain anymore to me. And, and since then she's been amazing and, and mm-hmm. we made that adaption, but, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of extreme when it comes to that kind of stuff, to be honest with you. I, I don't think it's extreme. I think that like the, dude, a big part of what we say to our words are like the first tangible reality of like anything we're thinking. Exactly. So if we're speaking something and complaining, it's just like we're taking these these thoughts that and turning them into matter, right? Sound and energy. So sure. Um, but dude, so dude, that's that's interesting philosophy. Now, when it comes to uh, your team and the people around you, how do you structure your org? Before we got went live, I think you said you have I don't know. You said sixty five people. Yeah, between the whole portfolio, we have about 60, 65 people. Um, main the organizational chart. We're actually literally going through a reorg right now. Uh, actually. Like, yeah, that was like one of the things I saw at the annual, uh, once again, going back to traction, which I think we were talking about before this, we had our annual meeting and I just realized that I I was actually, um, in my opinion, I was too deep in my organization and I wasn't, uh, I had too many managers and not enough doers. Like we had a lot of doers. We started really scaling. Then we started hiring managers to manage the doers. But then eventually we got to the point that like we had too many managers managing either managers or doers and they weren't actually getting stuff done. So our payroll was really inflated for what i think it should have been Mm -hmm. Uh, i mean he was eating up like you know 40 percent of our revenue and i'm just like dude this is fucking nuts and so i ended up uh 
we're in the middle of a reorg, but that's a long way of saying that the way that it's set up is that there's me at the top of the org. Is this what you want? This level? Of, okay. <laughs> me at the top of the org. Uh, there's only two people that report to me, um, or technically three. One is my executive assistant. Uh, underneath my executive assistant is my house manager. So executive assistant covers everything that has to do with like my life. And then my house manager covers everything that everything that has to do with my life in Miami, right? So like sometimes I'll need packages taken somewhere or I'll host an event or something like that. And so my house manager covers that because my EA is remote, right? So that And that's the perfect combo that I found. Uh, I used to have my... EA also be in person and doing house manager tasks, but then I found like if they're a really good EA, they're not going to be one to do like folding your laundry and shit, right. you know. So, uh, so there's the EA house manager. My family office uh, also reports directly to me, and then I have my director of operations. Uh, underneath my director of operations is where we have head of uh, 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 support and billing, head of sales, head of client success, and head of media. And then each one of those has um, like. Head of sales, obviously, has sales team and setting team. Head of client success has the client success team, the campaign manager, uh, and, like, uh, support staff. Head of billing has, like, the tech billing operations underneath them as well. Um, and so if you look at your team, uh, the are the, the people that are your leadership team, are they the people that have been with you the longest or are they the people that you've hired and recruited? Through? Ironically enough, like I was saying even before we started doing this, like, we're, we're in such a reorg right now that there's actually um, – Hmm. It's definitely not people who have been in with me since the beginning that I did this. Uh, I, I have almost – it's really funny. I'm, I'm hosting this mastermind in Paris in like two weeks, and uh, one of my old employees is, it just bought a ticket to it. And I was on my call with my team this morning, and I was like, yeah, Christian just bought a ticket to this. How cool is this? And I realized that not one person on that call knew who the hell Christian was because <laughs> he had worked here like uh, two years ago, and we have almost an entirely new company. In the, and, and we don't have turnover. I'd say 90% of the people that leave our company are – fires. I can't really think of a lot of people that have quit. Um, I don't know if that's how you define turnover or not, but it's not that uh, it's not that they're leaving. But I've just learned that, like I said before, uh, it's just like I have a tendency to try to want to coach people up and like hold on to them longer than I think that I should. And I'm not doing them any favors either. And so uh, I'm just got like in the past 12 months, I've just gotten much more on the lines of like, look, you're really good at what you do. It's not what I need here. Like, I'll give them a chance. We'll do a performance improvement plan. But I'll be like, uh, it's it's not working here. And I'll just let them go and I'll put somebody else in the place. So the people that are running my leadership team, um, uh, yes, I will say two out of four of them moved their way up the ladder. And then the other two were outside hires. Okay. Um, so with, uh, looking from the outside perspective, I think a lot of people would say things you're good at, right? You're good at systems. You're good. I mean, literally that's the name of your company. <laughs> um, but dude, one thing you're, I believe you're really good at is, uh, you've been able to sustain your place in this industry for, uh, much, for longer than most people offers come in, they blow out offers come in, they blow out. Like you've been pretty stable in your position for what, like almost five, six years. Yeah. Five years. Yeah, so just about. dude, with that being said, like, why do you think that is? And and how have you been able to maintain it? Yeah, I appreciate you saying that. That um, I, that means a lot. It, it's only kind of coming to the realization, like recently, where um, like just people that are saying that the same thing to me recently. I just uh, I'm, I'm super grateful for it. But I was just like, wow, I guess I've never really thought of it like that. Um, for me, I think it kind of comes to another one of our values is client centricity. And so, like, uh, I I used to have a B two C make money online offer, um, and I taught people like how to like uh, get rich fast. Get rich fast. <laughs> And so I did that for like a year and we did well. We did like 7.5 million. First year I did it, launched it, scaled it. And it was great. People were seeing results. You did 7.5 million in the first year? Yeah. Were you in info before that? Like, did you know how to Yeah, this was, a, this was like, I had scaling with systems for okay, three so years. That, so yeah, exactly. I knew what, it, but it was a different, I was serving a different avatar or whatever. Sure. But, uh, but yeah, I definitely had skills around like, scaling and you know i've done it for thousands of our clients as well so and i had always seen all my clients come in on a b2c make money online offer and just seen like them fucking crush it like they're not even great entrepreneurs but because the market for b2c make money online is literally so massive that they could just run a youtube ad with no targeting on it whatsoever and get like a 6x roas right and like here i am with like a 2.5x roas with like b2b layer targeting and so I was like, fuck it, let's just try this. Uh, it's pretty much teaching people how I like became an integrator and, and built other businesses. And uh, long story short, I did that for a while, but it just was like not really in line with um, – we were getting client results. There's no doubt about it, but it just wasn't really in line. Like I just didn't see myself doing that every day for like helping those people every day on a one-on-one -on -one basis. I got so much more like juice out of working with business owners and having conversations like this, like you know, talking about org charts and responsibilities and all that stuff versus like how do you – 
change your mindset to like make your first thousand dollars online. Like I just, I felt like I was kind of, I don't, I don't want to say selling myself out a little bit, but I was a little bit on the B2C offer, make money online. And so I just had like, I, I believe that if you can't do something every day, don't do it for a day. And so I just was like, you know what? And so I literally had this company. I had 30 employees in it. We were doing multiple seven figures a year. And in December of not last year, but the year before that, I shut it entirely down. I, I gave everybody the entire month's pay of December. And then I said, hey, uh, unfortunately, I'm not going to do this anymore. No reason to do it other than I just didn't know I wasn't going to do it long term. So I guess that's a long way of answering your question of just like, I, it sounds cheesy. I just absolutely really love what I do. I could talk about this literally all day long to anybody that would listen to me. I do want to find better leveraged vehicles of doing this so I can make more money doing it and scale like to a hundred million a year. Uh, but I, I think one of the reasons why I've been around and maintain the position is just because client centricity, like we actually care about a reputation very much in this marketplace. I'm very aware of what I say and all of that stuff. And the second thing is that uh, I just absolutely love doing this. And like, it's going to sound cheesy, but I would do this shit for free. Like, you know, I, I would do this stuff for free any day of the week, but I do have a plane and I do like a lot of nice <laughs> things. So I, I do, I do charge money. There's no doubt about it. But uh, yeah, I think it's those two things for sure. <clears throat> yeah. I love that. I think that the offers that, that have the biggest friction are the ones where the fulfillment's weak. Yes. And so in, uh, in uh, like make money online offers, you're coming in. Uh, Joel Orway had this uh, in his book, had this, you know, Joel Orway. Yeah. So he had this philosophy where it's like, he has like these circles and it's like kind of goes into like, um, level of buyer sophistication. Um, you're working with sophisticated buyers who've tried and either are doing well or tried a lot of things and failed before. Um, make money online is like some guy who like just wants to make cash. And yeah, his job. exactly. <laughs> totally different mindset. Like they're coming in like, you know, nothing against these people, but we had like truck drivers and we had people and like, and then what's, what happens is like you start to build this monster and then like, we were kind of talking about payroll and stuff before. And so then it's like, you know, it, you start in the beginning serving a certain type of avatar, but as you start scaling, you start to get like to a colder and colder market. And you're like, oh, this person, like they definitely could see results, but they're maybe not. But like then the sales team would close them. So you get the ROAS back. And so, um, ultimately, and then you're dealing with like a 75 year old person. Yeah. Trying to, to do tech. Try, exa- exactly. And, and like, and once and again, how as, do you, how do you get the results exactly you can do everything for them but it's not gonna work and and so for us you you're literally nailing it all on the head i was just like wow this is so yeah the, i would say that another big benefit is the industry that i'm in um like and the people that i serve i think there's pros and cons to it for sure but like our average client is already doing decently well like they're already trying to scale their business and um and so those people are a lot less likely to be like problems or headaches and then they would be the person that's literally coming in like i thought that i was going to make a hundred thousand dollars like the, my From first day three days one, yeah. Yeah, and it also has to do with the marketing though like once again taking extreme ownership going back to this even right before we got on this podcast we were talking about this industry it's a little insidious because it's like people copy people then people make bigger and bolder claims and guarantees and so then you have to do the same thing and so then your marketing has to get bigger and bigger and then there's a, such a misalignment of expectations between what someone wants what you're marketing to them and then what's actually realistically doable in like 30 60 90 days of somebody who's like never changed their life at all and so yeah we decided to go uh, I guess either depending on the way you look at it upstream or downstream a little bit to where somebody's like past that stage mm. and uh and they have a little bit of a semblance of like, okay, I have most of the mindset stuff down. I just need help with like marketing, sales, operations, clients, et cetera. And that's way easier because then it's literally like, oh, yeah, just change these three things in your business. And then we'll we tri- triple your business in 90 days versus it's like, oh, dude, you still believe that like, you know, that that everything's a scam. And I got to work with you to break down right. that belief. You know what I mean? Yeah. You, you made an interesting video on YouTube, which was like, it was like a webinar. I mean, all your, all your YouTube content's like a <laughs> webinar, like, yeah. uh, but uh, it, it really uh, value packed. And I, I want to break that down a little bit here. But one of the uh, videos you made was on the, you broke down the five levels of buyer sophistication yeah. or, or things phases in the marketplace, right? Where you go from like brand new, 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 like to where you're having to like reinvent the new. Exactly. Um, and uh, the thing that's interesting is with that being said, is as we go through the, those levels that's when the claims have to get bolder and bolder and bolder and so i think like make money online like it goes through cycles but right now it's in a cycle where it's like like there's every single opportunity you can imagine and exactly we'll probably they'll probably be continue to reinvent it but um where you're at where do you think you're in in that realm ironically so yeah uh, first of all i love that you watched that video i i love that i think like if people understood that concept especially in our industry they would just like their lives would be 10 times easier and just for people that have never heard of it before i didn't create it it's, it's eugene swartz uh five levels of buyer sophistication but like one is like these people have no idea who you are or no idea about the opportunity it's like brand new in the marketplace an example of that would be something like like uh like uber uber was like holy this is uber didn't really need to like oh uber's this most amazing 
they didn't need webinars or sales funnels. It was just like, holy shit, I don't have to hail a taxi. I can do it from my phone. And then there's just to jump ahead. There's a third level, which is like now there's a lot of people in the marketplace. So now you have to do something more unique. So maybe it's Uber Black instead of just regular Uber. And so they were the first people to offer Uber Black in there. So you no longer have to do a private car service. You can just hire Uber Black to do it. And then so that's like introducing a new mechanism. And then the fifth level is where your market's just so saturated that um, you, you you can't just be introducing new mechanisms or making the mechanisms bigger or bolder. There has to be uh, some kind of even element of storytelling inside of there. And I think that's really where, in my personal opinion, that's where this like kind of creator economy is coming up right now. It's it's the it's the fact that right now most of the people that are in the creator economy are in such saturated niches where uh, people don't just like they they don't just want to be a closer. They don't just want to be a setter. It's like they don't just want to make ten thousand dollars a month online. They want to do that learning from this person that they've been following and learning from for the past 30 days, 60 days, 90 days from some mm-hmm. kind of organic branded content. So I think that where we're at right now, it's also, I'm in a, I'm in level five. I think same thing with MMO, you're in a level five and we've just invested in the past four years and built, you know, I have 880 videos on YouTube. You know what I mean? So like uh, we've been investing into building the brand over the past few years. And I think that's one of the reasons not only that we've stuck around, but that we also do decently well is because it's like, People literally, we have uh, Hyros, which I know you're familiar with, and like we see the tracking inside there, and like we'll close deals from people that like first opted in three and a half years ago. Like we're closing them today that have just been following me for years, and so that's another thing we have working for us. Yeah, it's cool. I've got a we we properly set up Hyros about a year and a half ago, so I I only have the data from like that point onward. But um, we have people that like literally save up. Yeah, like they're like, okay, yeah, like I'm saving up to buy your X Y Z program, um, and I, I would imagine that's the same with your stuff. Um, the thing that's really fascinating, so you've got kind of your, uh, your YouTube, the way it's structured is you have a few videos that have really gone off. And I'm curious if you ran traffic to those, like the click, the click up one, the, uh, the LinkedIn the Apollo one. The only time we, so we've only really ever run ads to one video and it was, uh, the self-sustaining funnel, funnel video. Some of the stuff got we're it. talking about right now, that was the first, and that was just about 60 days ago that I was like, damn, like we do ads on Instagram to get uh, people to look at it. We do ads elsewhere. And so we've kind of restructured our whole marketing strategy in the past three to four months to follow what we call the self-sustaining funnel where like we're, we're putting people instead of opting in just straight to our free content and uh, on YouTube. And so we started running YouTube discovery ads to our top of funnel video, specifically the self-sustaining funnel. And so that has like 65,000 views, but we're getting on YouTube. There's two big metrics that we look at earned views and oh, I'm sorry, cost per view and cost per earned view. So cost per view is for us right now, like anywhere between seven and 14 cents uh, to get someone to watch the video. And then on YouTube, they also track something called cost per earned view, which is uh, how much it costs for someone to watch, not just that first video you sent them to, but then organically, they're going to go watch another video on your channel in the next seven days. YouTube Mm -hmm. tracks that. And right now it costs us anywhere between like 25 cents and 35 cents to get someone to watch two videos, which is nuts. If you, because if you think about it, like, you know, you're an ads guy as well. It's like, I've run ads and it, it's not uncommon for our cost per lead to be $20 and our play rate on our video sales later to be uh, 50% uh, once they get past the opt-in. So that means that you're typically costing you about $40 to get someone to watch your video sales letter. And then you compare it to if you just put your video sales letter on YouTube and drive discovery ads over to it, it's costing us 16 cents to get someone to watch that video. And even more important than that, if they don't book a call, even though I do make a call to action that uh, we're getting about 50 percent of people to then watch another video on our YouTube channel later on as well. Hmm. That's, that's cool. And I think that the the thing with uh, what you're doing, it's not as sexy. Like you don't have, uh, you know, a million followers. And you're not doing these like extravagant video, Mr. B style videos, sure. but uh, it's converting. Yeah. And your videos are the kind of videos where like people in our industry like send them to each other yeah like check this out like dude one of them that actually got sent recently was one where you're breaking down your done with you done for you uh done do it do, do it yourself. yourself and it was just like the easiest simplest thing and so the fact that your content's making circles with high level people speaks to the volume of like the strategy and the customers you're talking to yeah dude i appreciate you saying that 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 you're, i know you're jazzing me up a little bit here but that that means uh it's funny because uh like the other day i was i was talking to my girlfriend and uh I got this message from this guy on Instagram. He has like 1.3 million followers on Instagram. He's crushing it in the financial e-learning business. Yeah, I've never even heard of him, but like he was like, yo, I just wanted to send you a message. I've been, I've watched like every video of yours on YouTube and like this shit should be like 50 grand and you're putting it on YouTube. And it just, I showed him my girlfriend and I was like, this is literally exactly the type of client that I want to be attracting. And we ended up having dinner uh, later that uh, week in C-Spice and uh, had a really great conversation. I learned a lot from him as well. But yeah, it's, it's, I'm not, 
I don't know if I'll ever be like uh, like Hermosi went like eventually very mainstream like with the videos like you know the the diet and all that stuff which I'm I mean he, he obviously knows what the fuck he's doing I'm just saying that and I might eventually do that as well but right now like my videos get on average let's say one thousand to three thousand views but like you said it's like the people that are watching these dude fifty percent of our revenue comes in from our YouTube like no doubt about it and so they're like sending them to other people and uh, would I like to get more views there's no doubt about it but. Even right now, I had a conversation with our media team right before we came here, and like <laughs> my mo- most recent video was actually um, I-, I think you had Dan Martell on your uh, yeah, so I had Dan Martell on my uh, podcast, and um, we we switched. Your from- thumbnail was sick on that, bro. That's what I'm about to say. So it's funny. <laughs> Uh, we switched from doing like a super high production. Like it takes two weeks for these video editing to get it out. And I was like, you know what, dude, let me just fucking loom video a Google doc and let me put it up on, on YouTube. And we've been doing that and it's been working so well. And it takes, I don't even need the editing team now. I just go straight loom video, Google doc. I might do a click funnels lead magnet just to get the, if they want the access to the Google doc and they'll uh, opt in for it. I'll put it on YouTube. And then the only other bottleneck. So one of our other values is simplification and systemization so the only other bottleneck i have from not even needing a media team is uh thumbnails and i was like what if i just fucking put a photo up instead of doing uh like an actual thumbnail and so i did a photo that dan and i took at the uh at during the podcast and it's converting at the same click-through rate as like my graphic design thumbnail guy that mm-hmm. did it and uh and so yeah it's uh it's like very simple and so all that being said I think the goal is actually uh, next month I want to do five. So right now we're doing three videos a week. I think next month I want to do five videos a week uh, okay. and ramp it up. Yeah. And so, but the only way you could do that is if you're doing like raw loom videos, maybe jump cuts and like photos. I don't think you at scale, it would be real difficult to do like crazy animations and thumbnails and all that. I had a media team of 15 people and I hated it. So like, I, I like this kind of leaner approach for sure. Unless you're a full-time content creator, like, you know, then, yeah, then case... it might make sense. Yeah. But like at the same time, just answer me this question. If you're a full-time content creator and you could, once again, I, I, who I'm going after is different than maybe what the person who's like trying to be Mr. Beast on here. But like, if you could, all things being equal, put out the same content and one requires a team of one person and the same amount of work and one requires a team of 15 people, I would always take the team of one. Even if you had 10%, 20% less, um, views or something like that if you could do it by yourself you know you and i were talking about this before we started rolling here like when you start getting payroll and team members and like the thing that you started to love doing this becomes this like monster that you're kind of more managing than you are um like enjoying your business and so i'm always uh the fan of like we definitely have team members like i said but if i could eliminate it or automate it i'll always try it even at least test it at first mm. <laughs> um with with the content though what scares a lot of people i speak to and i don't have this limiting belief but some people do which is like if i give them all this free stuff they're not going to buy my course yeah like have you noticed any impact on that it's a good question so like i think that uh i, I was having this good conversation with ryan uh, pineda earlier about this too so like what i used to do was like i would create videos and i would create products high ticket low ticket videos and i would just like just do whatever i wanted to do and now what i started doing about six months ago is i like sat back and i was like okay let me actually create what the product suite of what we're doing is going to be. Let me create a one pager of our marketing material of who we're going after, what their pain points are, what topics I would cover inside of my content around that, what solutions we solve. And then let me decide what are the different products and how do they play into each other and like so they don't cannibalize each other. Like last year, we would have like a product that was a recurring subscription thing. And then it was like this high ticket, but also the high ticket included the recurring subscription. It was all very confusing. And so a while ago, I just kind of put it together and I was like, cool. Okay, so now what we have is uh, the free content is what I put on YouTube. Then I have a low ticket products. Then I have a $97 a month subscription products. And then we have our two high ticket products. And now that I have it like literally in a graphic in Canva of what the different things that people get for different things on there, I know that like I can create a video about this because it's not going to cannibalize my high ticket offer. And and the other thing that I've noticed, and this might help the people that listen to this as well, at least in my industry, um, I've seen a kind of a scary, I won't say a scary trend, but there's a lot of people, specifically content creators, who are like literally giving away entire courses online for free, right? They're putting like literally what they used to charge $15,000 for on their YouTube in a course or something like that, totally for free. And all you do is maybe is opt in or something like that. And the way I look at it is this, <clears throat> you know, uh, there's 22 immutable laws of marketing. And what the first law is first is better than better. And so I don't want to be the last in this trend right now where if you really think about it, if the only thing separating you from your competitors is that you have better information than your competitors, and I'm specifically talking about the e-learning info space, 
it's not that much of a moat and not that much of a competitive edge because how long does it take for your competitors to funnel hack your stuff or buy one of those your courses online for $35 that these fucking people sell to your Instagram followers and stuff like that? How long does it take for somebody to do that? And then now your your information is out there. So for us, the real value what we provide is really in a lot of the client success team that we have, the one-on-one work that we'll do, the done for you, the mastermind events, et cetera, et cetera. And the info itself is like, I'm not I'm not trying to say, oh, the info is where all the solutions to everything you want to in the world is in here. So by underst- if, if you're really concerned that if you gave it all away by putting your best content on YouTube, in my opinion, then your stuff isn't uh, – you don't have a good enough product suite because you're really just selling information. And in the high-ticket space for like five, ten, fifteen, twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000 – no one's really buying anymore, like just information. And if this was a different time, if people weren't literally putting entire courses on YouTube for like free, I would say, yeah, keep it guarded. But I'm seeing this trend, even like you had said earlier, a lot of my clients as well, I'm seeing this trend of people doing that. And I just don't want to be the last of the table. I don't want to be the person that's like, oh, all my stuff's protected and reserved. Uh, and then everyone else is going out there and teaching something similar. And then who is people going to listen to? The guy that gave it all away for free or the guy that's like, oh, no, first you got to pay me $15,000. So I'm trying to kind of be ahead of that curve a little bit. Okay. Yeah, it makes sense. Um, it, so when, when it comes to your funnel, these people are coming in, they're seeing your stuff. You can't really... Like you can't really specifically call them, so you're kind of just waiting for them to book on your calendar. Um, how does your sales team o- operate, and h- like how do you fill your team's calendar um, through all these things that are happening? Yeah, that's a good question. So going back to what I said earlier, like I have that YouTube video on the self-sustaining funnel. What we used to do was like opt-in page to video sales letter to a calendar page, except and sales call, et cetera, et cetera. What I'm seeing now is like I've kind of replaced all of my gated content, like opt-in pages, webinars, BSLs, with YouTube just organic YouTube people going to the YouTube channel. And I also noticed that because like, I don't know about you, but for us, I've never seen more and more people give fake information when they're opting into stuff than I have right now. It's mm-hmm. like literally 50% of the people that are giving us their stuff will give us their maybe the right email, but everything else is like, because everyone in our industry at least has been so inundated that they know that like, if they're opting into a training, they don't have to give them their accurate information because on the next page, they're going to get the training or whatever. So like, you can't be like, oh, I'm going to send you the training in, this, in the text message. Everyone knows that that's bullshit. So once again, I'm talking about my industry. So what I realized is like, okay, if uh, there, there's a study done, the General Social Survey, it's the largest interperson study done in the world on trust. And we're at the lowest point of person-to-person trust in the last 40 years in the United States. And so what I'm learning right now is like, okay, everyone's giving away all this information for free online. Um, we're at the lowest point of person-to-person trust uh, in, in the United States in the last 40 years. Um, and... I can kind of jump ahead of this curve a little bit by saying, okay, let me put all my best content on YouTube. And then the other benefit is that YouTube is like a marketing team. They're like a setting team for you. YouTube, if you can get somebody to watch your video, they're going to send it to their friends. And then they're going to also YouTube pixels them. And so then the next time they're on YouTube, when you have a YouTube video that comes out, they watch that video of yours. And if you really, you know, I've spent literally millions of dollars in, in marketing. I've built thousands of marketing systems. If you boiled marketing down to one thing, it's really just getting people to consume your content before a sales call. Like that's that's the way that I see marketing. And you really want to try to have them consume the most efficient amount of content before the sales call. But long story short, it's consuming content before the sales call. So if I can get people to watch content, once again, super leverage where I'm just in my room three times a week filming three videos, uploading it with a photo and no no like processing or anything like that, no editing. If I am doing that, uh, then we can scale to millions of views in a weekly basis without a, a team there at all. And it's so much simpler. And then when people are ready, they will opt in, become uh, book a call, and uh, become uh, get on the sales team calendar. Now, your question was like, okay, well, how do you fill the sales team calendar? Well, first of all, just by doing what I just said a second ago, we almost fill the sales team calendar. So like just by doing organic content and driving traffic to the organic content, we'll fill the, the sales team calendar. But another two huge drivers of growth other than YouTube – it's going to be, first of all, paid ads, obviously. So we do we do still do opt-ins and low-ticket funnels, et cetera, et cetera. But we're just like, but we're just moving that from being the full thing to like a little bit less. Like we're, we're lowering the ad spend. The goal is to be like 90% organic and 10% paid. And uh, the other thing is the setters and the uh, and our email list. I'd say our email list is number two. Uh, so it's YouTube, email list, because, you know, I have an email list of a few hundred thousand people I've been generating over the past few years. And uh, underneath these YouTube videos, I'm saying, hey, if you want to access this entire doc, 
go below and give me your information and we'll give you access to the entire doc. So then they're giving us their name, email, phone number. Some of them are real, some of them are not. And then the setters are going to outbound dial them or the email list is going to blast out and put them on, on the calendar. Hmm. Um, so uh, have you noticed that the quality of your people is better given the content you're making or is it just like the same? No, it's a way better. It's like not even a question. That's uh, the only reason we did it is because so um, – like a year ago, we put something we call the sales call scoring calculator into our company. So the number one, I've worked with like thousands of sales teams. The, <laughs> Dude, every sentence you have is, the, I put the system in and then this is the result. Because I, I'm, I'm a huge That's systems amazing. guy. Yeah, but, because I, I just don't, I'm like, okay, if we're going to do something, we need to solve it forever. I don't want to just do Band-Aid solutions. So I, I like literally part of our process is like, how do we solve this once and for all? And so well, the number one KPI for sales teams that I've experienced is um, is dollar per call. So if you have 10 calls on your sales team's calendar, how much money are you making out of those calls? Depending on who shows up, uh, who closes, it doesn't matter. So let's say you have 10 calls on your calendar, uh, five of them don't show up. Of the five that do show up, you close one, you make $10,000, you'd be at $1,000 dollar per call. Does that make sense? Yeah. So that to me is the best way to de- determine sales team efficiency in the high ticket sale world. Because like, what is the only thing limiting you on the sales team side from making more money? It's how many sales, how many closed deals that your sales team can make, how much availability you have on the calendar. So instead of ramping up more and more sales reps all the time, I was like, how can we just make sure the people on the calendar are as qualified as possible? So a year ago, we put something we call the sales call scoring calculator, which is, it's actually, we use AI to use it now too. We use ChatGPT, but it was a Google sheet and it says on a scale of one to four, um, how qualified is this person? If they're a one, we auto cancel them. If they're a two, we double book them on the calendar. And if they're a three and a four, we leave them on the calendar without any need of kind of all, uh, qualification. And since we did that, the average cash per sales rep that we're able to uh, that take in has more than doubled because now they're just speaking with threes and fours all the time. And so I say all that to say that a year ago, we started actually tracking, not just like, oh, the sales team's like, oh yeah, this guy was qualified, this guy wasn't qualified. Now it's like we have something that we call the sales call score. It's really an MQL. And now we feed that back to the CRM. And so we can see how our uh, score is going over time. So I can say people who come from YouTube, they're averaged a 3.5. People from Facebook ads, they're averaging a 2.5. Mm. Uh, this month we're at a three, this month we're at a two. And so over time, w- once again, I just try to back up everything I say with data. We have seen that YouTube by far gets us way more threes and fours. And a great example is you're, you would be a three or a four on our, our scoring calculator. Uh, also, um, the guy that I told you that hit me up Hope on Instagram. Four. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you're a four. You're a four. No, you're, you're a ten out of ten, man. You're a ten. And uh, and then the guy that hit me up on Instagram, he was a four as well, right? Yeah. And so like these people that used to never really hit me up ever, uh, now I'm getting all these people that I'm just like, holy shit! Like you know, I even had uh, Jeremy Miner, his CMO, is one of our clients, um, and like I've learned a lot from them. And like the fact that he's one of our clients as well, it's like some of these people that are opening doors. I don't think ever would have happened if these people didn't consume my content on YouTube first. Like even if it's an employee in the company and they'd be like, yo, we need to work with this guy. So I would say by far, for sure, our most qualified people have come from, and it's, it's increased in quality since we made that like a main priority. Does that create, um, does that create higher ticket uh, sales? Like, and, uh, like, you know, I don't necessarily think that I'm someone that's going to come and buy a $40,000 package. Sure. And I don't actually know what your offer stack is, but, uh, are the high quality people spending more cash or they're just better customers to work with? Uh, that's a good question. I don't know uh, because our offer stack is the price point is relatively say the same in the last two years. I couldn't say if like the average lifetime value has increased since we've done that. The velocity of sales has increased. Uh, but sure, you may not spend $40,000, but you may send the video to somebody else. Or let's just say, for example, on this YouTube video here or this this podcast that we're doing here, you've said you watch my videos, which I'm super grateful for. And so somebody listening to this that respects and likes you, they were going to be like, oh, wow, he says that he likes Ravi's videos, so maybe I should check out Ravi's videos. And then that might lead to a sale uh, in addition to that because you're kind of transferring your trust over to me. So I don't necessarily know if it's like people – I will say we do have a $60,000 package, and uh, every single one of the – I've never closed an ad person to $60,000. They are always from YouTube. Um. Yeah, man. Cool. Um, so uh, I think there's a lot of friction around YouTube uh, and a lot of the stuff you're talking about. There's a lot of systems you're talking about implementing. Um, when I work with business owners, I don't care if they're new or there's someone who's already had a ton of experience and they're crushing it. The common sentiment is I'm overwhelmed and here's another thing to do. And so uh, I would imagine people coming in and listening to your stuff. It's like, that's exactly what I need, but I'm too overwhelmed to implement it. Um what system do you have to <laughs> what system do I have to help to them make systems? <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. Um 
You know, the overwhelm thing, I just think it's anytime I hear time management or the word overwhelm, I almost always attribute it to a lack of priorities. So like if I knew what I knew now uh, about sales and data and marketing, all this stuff four years ago, I would have gone as hard as I'm going on on YouTube right now four years ago. And the only thing is I just didn't know back then. But the nice thing about people listening to your stuff is that hopefully they're going to listen to you or I and they're going to be like, oh, I need to do this now that you're, they're learning from my mistakes. And so, yes, you're right. To go all in on this, I had to cut back on other things. Like I had to stop doing other things, both in my personal life and in my business life. So like people that are overwhelmed by things, it's just simply that, um, that they're not prioritizing. And if you're a business owner, I think for me, there's only really two things that matter, getting more people to know about you. And uh, keeping those people that know about you buying more. Like those are the, those are the two things that matter. So if you can just line your day up with those two things, then um, then I think you can work it out. So for me, I film content three times a week from 6 to 8 in the morning, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. And so that's like I, it's in my calendar. doesn't matter where I am. You know, tomorrow's Friday. And uh, I'm going to literally go for and, and I brought a, I, I, right before I left, I bought a little Shure uh, mic that plugs in your computer. And like now Loom also has um, can, can connect wirelessly to your iPhone. So mm-hmm. I bought a jack. So I actually tested it before I left and it was like studio quality sound and video. And it was just my iPhone, a thing. And uh, and the Shure mic, the Shure mic was one hundred and thirty dollars or two hundred dollars, something like that. So like let's say for two hundred and twenty dollars uh, and an iPhone, which everybody has here, I have a full studio set up. And so I just need to dedicate my time tomorrow morning to do it. And once again, I'm just doing Loom videos. There's no editing involved. And I'm just going to shoot it in my, in my, so it's, you know, I just think just get started with what you got. And like, I think people make it way too complicated and look at my, I mean, once again, I'm not the most popular YouTube person in the world. and I don't know everything. So maybe don't look at my stuff, but I'm filming content and I'm just making a, a Loom video and uploading it to, with a photo as a thumbnail and working clients from it. So you're putting text over the thumbnail though. Uh, so we were, yes, but the one that I did with uh, Dan Martell was just a photo of him and I. Dude, I swear it. there was like 100 million in Well, what letters. we do is after two hours, so we use TubeBuddy for a split test tool. Okay. So what happens is our thumbnail designer creates two video or two thumbnails. And after two hours, if the click-through rate is below 6%, they will test the other thumbnail to see if it'll increase. Oh, interesting. Okay. Yeah, so that's uh, TubeBuddy is pretty cool that lets you to do that. And the velocity of views is always fastest right when you publish it. So we always publish at 12 o'clock Monday, Wednesday, Friday. And then within two hours, or after two hours, if it's less than 6%, they will switch out. This. So they might have switched out for that reason. One of my uh, uh, friends works with uh, one of the largest YouTubers on the planet, and uh, one thing they do is they that they put his face in it in the beginning because it gets pushed to the audience where they're familiar with the face. They take his face out after a certain period of time, oh, wow. and they just make it. Yeah, that's super smart. I never thought because that makes sense because it's always going to push it to your warm audience mm-hmm. first before wow that's a good I, i'm gonna take a note of that that's actually, <laughs> that makes a lot of sense um so one of the things you've talked about is uh taking care of your customers sure Dude, what happens when someone's having a bad experience or someone's not getting the results and they blame you uh in business it's not real to sit here and just give everyone a full refund sure. when they're unhappy how do you handle that yeah, I think you nailed it a good point, which is like, once again, you go back into like the info and coaching world. And even when I first started, it was like people like you're not going to ask a refund for like if you get a contract for your house or for something else like that. And for some reason in the info coaching consulting agency world, everyone just thinks that like, even though I signed this contract, it's not legally binding. or So it's but as you start to scale and you start to grow a team, like you do need to treat it like a real company, which is like if they sign a contract, you need to hold them to that. Now you're going to do whatever you can to make it right. But like you said, it's not realistic to just like give refunds all the time. And I, people are like, oh, I would, I would always do it, but it's like, yeah, all right, get half a million dollars in payroll every single month. And then see like, you know, if you would always give refunds to everybody. Um, and, and also people ask for refunds for just like the silliest reasons. Right. Uh, so or they make up some excuse and really yeah, exactly. They didn't take action. It, they didn't do what they needed to do. And so if I want going back to extreme ownership, once again, we do everything we can. We cl- we try to close the right people, so we have a one pager of who we're allowed to close, who, what what kind of money they're supposed to be doing, et cetera, et cetera. And then we try to optimize the whole client success process and like make it like baby spoon feed what we need in order for the client to get done. We take over a lot of the stuff for our clients. Like we write the ads for them, we write the video sales that are copy for them. So like all the stuff that we saw were sticking points. We do it for our clients. But no matter what you do, at some point you're going to have upset clients. And if you don't, you're just probably not scaling fast enough or hard enough. Um, so for us, um, the SOP, there's like an escalation process. So like I'd say anytime we have an unhappy client, about 80 to 90% of the time it gets handled just with their direct client desk manager. Like, cause in my experience, most people that are complaining, they're just like, they're dealing with frustration in their own life. And then they're just, 
they had paid you money. And so you're almost like almost like a therapist. You are forced to listen to them complain. And so a lot of times they just want someone to vent with. And so I've just trained my clients as managers to like listen to what they have to say. If they have valuable feedback, then let's action the feedback. Let's see if we can solve it. But I'd say eight times out of 10, people are literally just looking to vent. And then you try to work with them to solve it. Uh, the other time out of 10, like let's say it's one time out of 10, uh, it'll escalate to our client's test director. At that point, he'll come in and step in and see if we can offer something else to them. We always try to retain cash if possible. So can we offer you uh, to come to our next mastermind, a ticket to that? Can we offer you an extended extra month or two months? Can we offer you uh, a call with Ravi or something like that? Here's the way to get free uh, bonuses if you want. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> that's funny. Yeah. Once again, just giving it all away. You know what I mean? Yeah. That's like what I'm doing. And then the final path would be bring it because I'm also the head of legal in our company. So because uh, in our org chart. So a, a final path would be to bring it to me. And then like if absolute worst case scenario, I'll get on a call with them. And uh, in radical transparency, we have no guarantees. We don't offer money back uh, refund uh, guarantees. But like if I really felt like we had done something wrong, then I, I have process. Re- once going back to extreme ownership, I will process it. But um, kind of similar to what I'm having a conversation with an employee, if I'm letting them go, we just have, a, I get all of the data and all the information before we get on the call. Oh, you promised me this on the sales call. So then I pull up the sales call and we look at the transcript and I control F that word. And the, oh, oh, well, I thought, so like I just battle it with logic and, and I'm like, look, you came to us because you wanted to solve this thing. Uh, you're obviously not solving it. Um, I think we both can agree. It's potentially a little bit of both parties here. What if we do this X, Y, Z thing? We'll do this and we'll step in and do this for you. And so we'll do the special thing. And, um, I'd say every single time between those three things, it's like everything is salt. Uh, yeah. Hmm. That's cool, man. Dude, we've talked about a lot of uh, your offers, uh, the way you recruit uh, talent, building an infinite amount of systems in your organization. Um, dude, on the personal end, there's some things that, uh, dude, I don't know, you necessarily talk a lot about, you do talk about some things in your personal life, like sure. your, your planes, for example. Um, you have, what kind of plane do you have right now? So I have a Piper Cherokee 6. It's a six-seater prop plane, and uh, I'm in the process of buying a Sirius SR-22. Okay, nice, nice. Yeah. Don't they say Sirius is like the Rolls Royce of like the... the yeah, they call, well, they call the, well, I'm a Porsche man, so they call it the Porsche of the skies, yeah. Okay. yeah. And it has a parachute in it mm-hmm. as well, so it's like way You see that safer. video recently of the guy, the parachute, like he deployed it? No, I haven't. Oh, no. dude, it, it was like from like a month ago and it went really out. yeah and did it save his life uh yeah it saved yeah. his life yeah the plane was so so but oh who gives a shit dude that's why you have insurance everyone's like oh i don't want to ruin my plane i'm like dude fuck that <laughs> yeah, that's what literally i'm paying insurance 14 grand a year in insurance for like they can take the plane and i just want to take care of the people that are in the plane dude the plane was coming nose diving the parachutes like because that's how it comes down it nose dives yeah. and then uh it comes down it literally hits a dumpster you hear the guy scream inside the plane as it hits the ground and the Bystanders just filming. Oh my god! The guy gets out and is like, steps on the ground. He's like, <sighs> but can you imagine that like real life scenario, dude? And it's going fast too. Yeah, it's like, not. Yeah. It's not slow. Like it's. I mean, it's definitely slower than if you didn't have a fucking parachute. <laughs> that's for damn sure. Uh, but uh, you know, I'm very fortunate. I've never been. I'll knock on wood in an engine out scenario. But like you know, it, it's you as a pilot. That's all you think about. And like when you're flying the plane, you're always thinking about what they call best place to land. So you're always literally thinking like. If the plane engine went out right now, how would I land the plane 24 seven when you're flying that plane? So it would just be so much nicer to just be, I would still be doing that, but it's like, you just have m- way more options. Cause yeah, I wouldn't think like, oh, I'm going to land it in this dumpster. But then if you're like floating down, it makes it more realistic, land in the dumpster and then walk away. Okay. I, I took lessons, uh, flight lessons in a uh, Cirrus. Oh, nice. And, uh, and, uh, I took my first class. Uh, and when I did, he did what's called a stall, yeah. which he, you fall 500 feet in like this. Sure. And uh, when we landed, I said, I'm never flying. Really? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'd be open to it. Sure. But uh, I'd rather just, you know, even get into like a like a Pilatus or something. And yeah. Have, someone fl- have somebody else fly yeah. for you. The eventual goal for me. So my dream is like uh, within five to eight years, um, I want to get a property that's like eight acres and I want a runway on my property. Nice. That I, and I want like a Pilatus or maybe a Vision Jet, which is also by Sirius mm-hmm. as well. And like be able to take my family and like literally be able to land and take off in my backyard. That's the eventual goal. But that's funny about the, the stall. Thing. And for people that don't know, stall is like literally... When you you pull back on the plane enough that the wing the wind is not going over the wings enough to sustain lift, and so you literally that's how people actually crash the plane. Like you literally drop down, and then you break it by going down on the throttles. But I, I could see how it could be a little bit of a jarring experience, like because you, <laughs> you you are pretty much just free falling, like G force coming up, and it's a little scary. Dude, why why planes and flying? Uh, for me it was because like I in the past you know I've been doing the business stuff for like. Uh, five years now, uh, first an agency and then scaling with systems. And uh, for me, all I was doing in my life was like, um, 
work and working out. That was like my entire life consisted of that. And then I love talking about work. Like I said, I would talk about it forever, but I kind of wanted to be a little bit more of a Renaissance man where it's like, I could have a conversation with somebody else about something other than like business and uh, working out. And so I, <laughs> I go back to like systems and I was like, like I like literally was going online. I was looking at, I was trying to think of like, okay, what has utility? What could be a tax write off? What could be something? I'm always trying to do something unique, right? Uh, going back to 22 immutable laws of marketing, they would say new is better than better. So I was like, what could be something that's totally different that nobody else is doing? And so anyway, like at the cross section of this Venn diagram was a, like, was flying. And so, um, and I just went up in the first discovery flight and the, my instructor was like, this is the first time you've flown a plane and, I was, and maybe he was just jazzing me up because he wanted me to be a student. But I was like, yeah, he's like, bro, you have. And so and I got my the average student gets her license in about 70 hours in the United States. And I got mine right at the you have to you have to do minimum 40 hours. I got mine at 40.2 hours. So I also and not only did I want to do it, but then I was like kind of innately good at it. And uh, and then the benefits like it's just once you get up there and you actually do fly it by yourself on a, your first solo flight, it's it'll it'll change your life. Dude, I love it, man. Dude, thanks so much for coming on. Um, how can people connect with you and learn more? Yeah, of course. I appreciate you having me on. Uh, it was an awesome podcast. Uh, yeah, you can go look up my name anywhere, Ravi Bavala, R-A-V-I-A-B-U-V-A-L-A. Um, and like we had talked about on my YouTube channel, I have like over 800 videos on there. Or you can go to scalingwithsystems.com and we can help you out maybe there. Cool. Thanks, dude. This was fun. My pleasure. Boom. Bang.